I, I know we just did this, but again, I want to begin my report acknowledging that we're standing on Treaty 4 land, the traditional territory of the Cree, Salto, Dakota, Lakota, and Dakota peoples, and the home of the Métis people. And I ask that we remember that we are all treaty people. We are gathered here today because we have been called to journey together and entrusted with the Ministry of Reconciliation. I'd like to spend some time with you examining our theme. We have each been called by God, and through our baptisms, we have been set on a journey of discipleship. In our individual faith journeys, we are called to use the gifts God has given us, following the example Jesus has given us, and participating in God's mission in the world. We have been called into community in Christ. You may not have been baptized into the ELCIC or its predecessor churches, but somehow you have all ended up being part of the family of God that we know as the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Canada. Some of you best know this community as expressed in your local congregation or synodically recognized ministry. Some of you know this community best through the variety of mission and ministry activities that you are involved in. Some of you know this community best by the work that you do in regional ministry areas. And some because of the ministry of the synods who have elected you, or those of you who are delegates, to come and be here today. And some of you know the mission and ministry that we all do together as part of the National Church. But that is not the end of the community we are called to be a part of. We are full communion partners with the Anglican Church of Canada, who is at this very moment gathering in General Synod in Vancouver. We are members of the Canadian Council of Churches that gathers 26 member churches, including Anglican, Eastern and Roman Catholic, Evangelical, Free Church, Eastern and Oriental Orthodox, and historic Protestant traditions, and is this year celebrating its 75th anniversary. We are members of Kairos, one of 10 churches and religious organization, organizations working with people of faith or conscience all over the world for ecological justice and human rights. We are part of a whole host of other circles and commissions and standing committees and task forces. But even that is not the end of the community we are a part of. We are one of 350 member churches of the World Council of Churches who together represent more than half a billion Christians around the world. And in the Lutheran World Federation, we are part of a global communion of 148 member churches in the Lutheran tradition, representing over 75 and a half million Christians in 99 countries. And we are called to journey together, together, and entrusted with the Ministry of Reconciliation. The hymn that keeps going through my head is Bind Us Together, Lord. Would you please sing the chorus with me? Bind us together, Lord, bind us together with cords that cannot be broken. Bind us together, Lord, bind us together, Lord, bind us together in love. But what does it mean for us to be bound together in a world that seems to be unraveling. There are currently over 70 million refugees and internally displaced people, the highest levels of displacement on record. There are more than 40 current wars and armed conflicts taking place around the world right now. There are 16,306 endangered species threatened with extinction. Climate change is increasing the frequency and severity of natural disasters and extreme weather. Flooding, cyclones, drought, hurricanes, and tornadoes. Glaciers are melting 
and the oceans are rising. There are at least 68 long-term drinking water advisories affecting Indigenous communities in Canada. The recent report of the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls Commission calls the treatment of Indigenous women a Canadian genocide. One in seven people in Canada are living in poverty. Hate crimes against Muslims and Jews are rising in Canada and around the world. We could be here all day just listing the injustices experienced in our country and across the globe. We hear increasing voices of intolerance from our neighbor to the south and from within our own community and country. <coughs> it is into the middle of this unraveling world that God calls us to journey together and entrusts us with the Ministry of Reconciliation. But it isn't only the world that is unraveling. Sometimes it feels like our church is unraveling too. Like the majority of churches in, nor in the North, we continue to see decline in membership and financial resources. Some congregations have closed, some have merged, more will do both. Synods and the National Church and the Lutheran World Federation are all being challenged to prioritize their work and reimagine their structures. And into the midst of this unraveling church, God calls us to journey together and entrusts us with the Ministry of Reconciliation. Sing with me again. Bind us together, Lord, bind us together with cords that cannot be broken. Bind us together, Lord, bind us together, Lord, bind us together in love. And yet, and yet, we see new signs of life, new ideas, new forms of ministry, new partnerships, renewed understanding of what it means to be a missional, diaconal, prophetic church. How can this be? Well, it's God's church. The Holy Spirit continues to breathe new life into us. These dry bones can live. The Church of Christ is like a large tapestry, and the ELCIC is only one little piece of it. God is the master weaver who has created us and continues to bind us together. Maybe some moths have got in and eaten a few holes. Maybe some stitches have dropped, and we are unraveling in sections. But God has not abandoned us. God continues to weave us in new and unimagined ways. The reworking and the reweaving can be a little painful, and it can be a little scary because we're not in control and we can't see the big picture. But we can trust in God who has continued to weave and restore the church since God called it into being. This is not the first time the church has felt like it was unraveling, and it won't be the last. But God is faithful and continues to lavish gifts of vision and creativity and healing and courage and patience upon God's church and God's people. Let me share some of the work of the National Church as we try to face the unraveling and exercise the Ministry of Reconciliation. Our current strategic directions are, are courageous innovation, reconciled relationships, one body working together, and empowered disciples. Courageous innovation is a lot harder to do than it is to say. But we keep this before us 
knowing that God continues to call us to a new thing. Starting in 2015 and going until 2020, the ELCIC has been engaged in a process of synod mission initiatives. The National Church, through the Church Extension and Capital Fund, is providing a total of $1.5 million in funding to synods to be used for activities that are, that are experimental in spirit and genuinely seek to explore what it means to participate in God's mission in the world today. The primary focus of this process is discerning ways that local communities may seek to explore what God is up to in the local communities and neighborhoods and learn what it means to participate in God's mission in the world today. Local communities bring imagination, opportunity, and energy into this process. Synods are committed to providing leadership, discernment, and support for local innovation. The commitment of the National Church is to journey with synods in discernment and to learn from the process the implications for the stewardship of our resources in the future. We are very much still in the middle of this process, and we remain deeply committed to prayer, exploration, experimentation, and learning. I see signs of courageous innovation all across our church, like in Medicine Hat, where Unity Lutheran and the Evangelical Free Church swapped church buildings. It makes perfect sense to right-size your church building to the size of your congregation, but I know how deeply attached people become to church buildings. It took courage and vision and trust to go ahead with these plans. <coughs> or the merger of St. Mark's Kitchener, St. John's Waterloo, and Reformation Kitchener into one new congregation, Trillium. Three established churches with 351 years of history between them. There is always a sense of loss in closing congregations, but there is hope in the courage of imagining a new future together that makes the best use of the re resources that God has entrusted to you. Excuse me. These are just a couple of examples of the way we are being asked to consider how best we can participate in God's mission and together imagine and continue to build a church which is missional, diaconal, and prophetic. We will be looking at more of such possibilities when we consider reimagining our church public ministry in the ELCIC during this convention. Reconciled relationships is the heart of our, ministry, of our ministry and the inspiration for our convention theme this year. The work of re reconciliation between non-Indigenous and Indigenous peoples is an ongoing priority for our church and our country. It is inspiring to hear the various ways in which synods and congregations are responding to the call to work for reconciliation. These are just some examples. The Kairos Blanket Exercise is a resource that helps people learn about the history of contact between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples in the part of North America we call Canada. It was developed by our ecumenical partner, Kairos, and is being used by many groups, both inside and outside the church, including in ELCIC congregations. In 2018, the Kairos Blanket Exercise was part of the Canadian Lutheran Anglican Youth Gathering, CLAY. Through partnerships between CLAY, local Indigenous leaders, and Kairos, it was the largest blanket exercise ever held. You can read more about it in the annual report you can find on your table. But here are some other examples. Several MNO Synod leaders attended the Urban Indigenous Anglican Ministries Conference in Winnipeg in June. Both Lutheran Theological Seminary in Saskatoon and Martin Luther University College in Waterloo are providing cross-cultural Indigenous non-Indigenous experiences as part of the formation of rostered leaders. Lutheran Church of the Cross in Calgary hosted an elder-led reconciliation project. And for the past three years, Deacon Scott Knarr 
has been engaged in part-time ministry, building partnerships and effecting reconciliation between Eastern Synod Lutherans and the six nations of the Grand Community. <coughs> A whole host of new partnerships and friendships have been established through a variety of initiatives, most, no most notably the Music for the Spirit program for children and youth. The Eastern Synod and the Two Rivers Ministry area support this ministry with funding secured from a Synod mission initiative from the National Church. We need to continue to participate in and advocate for the fulfilling of all the calls to action from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and we will need to faithfully respond to the calls for justice from the National Inquiry into Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls. We continue to work for reconciliation as we work in a variety of partnerships to end poverty, welcome refugees, work for peace, protect the environment, challenge intolerance, and end human trafficking. We also need to ensure there is justice and reconciliation within our own church. National Church Council approved revised inclusive language guidelines that reflect sensitivity to gender as a spectrum, to race, sexuality, as well as differently abled people. NCC also adopted the Code of Conduct for use at all ELCIC-sponsored events as part of our commitment as a church to uphold the dignity of all persons and provide a safe and respectful place for people to gather. We work for reconciled relationships as we expand and deepen our ecumenical and interfaith partnerships. I look forward to our panel discussion on Saturday and hope that that conversation will encourage us more and more to engage our interfaith neighbours. The proposed action on Canadian Muslim engagement with the Anglican Church of Canada based on a common word will help us to do just that. Finally, we, need to work for we do work for reconciliation as we address human rights and respond to people in need through the Ministry of Canadian Lutheran World Relief. I can't underline enough how important this partnership is for fulfilling our mission as a church. We call our third strategic direction, One Body Working Together. It's a recognition that as a church, congregations and synodically recognized ministries, synods and national, as well as our Canadian in, and international partners, we're all part of the same body of Christ, part of the same tapestry, and we need to work more and more closely together, both to maximize our capacity to participate in God's mission, but also to be a greater witness of unity to this unraveling world. The proposed action affirming relationships of full communion with the Episcopal Church along with the Anglican Church of Canada and the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, will help us enhance our witness of unity. One of, the, one of the things we do best as the whole ELCIC is to reflect together theologically on the issues facing us in our country and our world. We will be spending time at this convention reflecting on the call to journey faithfully with those who are dying the end result of four years of discussion and deliberation across our church, which was initiated by Convention Action. Together, we will make decisions as a church on how to faithfully respond. We continue to discern together how God is calling us to call and equip pastors and deacons for our church. One of the recommendations re related to reimagining our church is to consider the ordination of deacons. We recently convened a consultation on global mission that involved representation from each of the synods and the national church. We reflected on the work of the global mission task force and the best practices for being in global companion relations. We were skillfully led by Pauline and Cynthia, two relationship managers from the ELCA global missions an excellent example of this, tang of this sign of our close rela relationship. <coughs> uh, 
Bishop Eaton, please take back our thanks to Global Mission for the way they enhance our ability to do that ministry. In December of last year, Bishop Sid and Kathy Haugen and I visited, visited our partner church in Argentina, Iglesia Evangelica Luterana Unida, or IELU. Visiting our partner is part of our fiduciary responsibility to ensure for ourselves and for the sake of Canada, Canada Revenue Agency that our charitable dollars are being spent in the way that they are designated. But it is so much more than that. It is a time to build on the relationship, to share stories and hopes and dreams and successes and failures. It's a time to pray together. It's a time to intentionally accompany each other in our ministry as people and churches. You'll find a reference to this visit in the annual report. Yelu is facing some severe challenges. Argentina experiences extremely high inflation, up to 55% a year. This has had a hard impact on the church and has meant that they have had to cut pastors' salaries to 50% across the board. Despite the challenges, Yelu remains a vibrant and hopeful church, trying hard to hear how God is calling them into mission in their time and place. One of the big takeaways for me is the reminder of how many resources we have been given in the ELCIC to use for mission in our country and around the world. We may be getting smaller, but we are still a medium-sized church with gifts to share. You'll find a handout about Global Mission on your table. National Church Council adopted a revised ELCIC Mutual Ministry Guide for use across the church. A small task force was appointed to work electronically to complete this work, an excellent example of the ways we can work creatively using the gifts of the members of our church. Coming from a recommendation of the 2017 Officers Consultation, we've established a giving task force with synod and national representation to reflect and make recommendations regarding stewardship, benevolence, plan giving, and more. And yes, we have heard you. We have established a task force to engage in broad consultation across the church to develop recommendations for a new vision statement for our church, replacing in mission for others. We look forward to seeing the fruit of their work in the fall of 2020. The task force has created a survey that they'd like you to participate in. And you can find that survey at the ELCIC display or by following the link that you can find on the screen. Our final strategic direction is Empowered Disciples. We have two joint Lutheran-Anglican gatherings that continue to bring us together and work to equip us for discipleship and renew our faith. I'm talking about the Canadian Lutheran Anglican Youth Gathering, CLAY, and the Anglican Lutheran National Worship Conference. It's my privilege, and I mean that, to be able to participate in both of those gatherings, and I'm always energized by the passion of those gathered and inspired by their faithful witness. Worship resources for smaller assemblies and communities without regular pastoral support continue to to be prepared by the Program Committee for Worship. The resources where two or three are gathered are available at worship.ca. A weekly sermon series also continues for congregations without a pastor or preacher and can be accessed by contacting Reverend Jane Gingrich. You can find out more details in your bulletin of reports and you can probably see where she is going to be waving just about now. There she is, table 21, come talk to her. You will recall that soon after I was elected, I called our church into spiritual renewal and invited us to pray, read, worship, study, serve, give, and tell. It worked for a while, and I'm grateful for everyone who engaged in that call. But here we are, and we still have more room to grow as we deepen into our discipleship. And I have learned a couple things along the way. One, is that seven things are too many to remember. <laughs> yeah. 
The other is that a scatter approach, inviting people to focus on whatever area they want, is hard to resource and hard to continually encourage. And so, we are launching a second round, a four-year emphasis on living our faith, as together we will pray, read, worship, and love. You will find a handout on your table. Starting this September, I am inviting you, I am inviting our whole church into a year of prayer. Following this convention, letters will go out to all rostered leaders and congregational leaders asking for their support and participation. As a whole church, I want us to learn about prayer, grow in our experience of prayer, and deepen in our regular practice. Through our website, e-communique, and social media, we will be sending out weekly encouragements and monthly pieces that are more in-depth. I hope that this will encourage all of us to feel more comfortable talking about prayer, but more importantly, praying with each other. I would love us to be known as the church that really knows how to pray. That might be a good tagline, actually. Starting in September 2020, we'll move on to a year of reading and learning about scripture together, and so on. <coughs> you can read more about the work of our church in your annual report and in the bulletin of reports. I encourage you to keep informed about what is happening through our church publications, through the website, and through social media. Let me move into some words of thanks. I want to thank my colleagues, Karen Ochtelstetter, Lisa Thiessen, Elizabeth Eaton, and Martin Junge, and especially Greg, Larry, Sid, Jason, and Michael, my colleague bishops. Thank you for your generous support and partnership. I want to thank National Church Council, and in particular the officers of the church for your hard work and commitment. I want to thank all of you who serve on committees and task forces, synod and congregational councils. And a special word of thanks to the hardworking and de dedicated staff of the National Office who have served over the past biennium. And they have included Barb Weeb, Rick Natividad, Dennis Wo um, Wolachiak, sorry Dennis, Desiree Mendoza, Catherine Crevici, Norm Cool, Ken Ward, Carter Brooks, Trina Gallup Blank, Paul Gares, Lyle McKenzie, Andre, Andre Levain, and Gret, uh, Laverne, oh, Andre Laverne, Gretchen Peterson, and Kyle Giesbrecht. Would you please stand and be recognized? I know that I do not work alone, but rather I'm part of a team of leadership across our church and with our partners, and for that shared leadership and collegial support, I give thanks to God. They say that time flies when you're having fun. Well, it hasn't all been fun, but the last 12 years have really flown by. It has been an honor to serve as your national bishop, and depending on your will, I would be willing to serve again. I love our church, and I'm proud of what we do and what we stand for. We pray fervently. We work for justice passionately. We face challenges head on, and we embrace the future with hope. We give thanks to God for the grace we have received and strive to share that grace with the world in such need. Soli Deo Gloria. To God alone the glory. Thank you. <clears throat>